Dr. Darren Keaton's lab at Florida State University. And today I'll be talking about uh, genetic anatomy of sensory perception uh, in Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake. Uh, so at first glance, uh, people tend to affiliate uh, pit vipers with long, scary fangs, uh, deadly toxic venom, uh, and a lightning fast strike of death. Um, they're also exothermic, uh, they have very low metabolic needs, which makes them great opportunistic hunters. Uh, these are all traits uh, that are predatory traits, and they've experienced selection towards some sort of uh, functional optimum. Uh, but I would argue perhaps what is more interesting about pit vipers is that they are masters of perception. Uh, of course, the first step in predation is actually perceiving your prey. Um, and adaptive traits experience selection towards functional optimums, and this is uh, largely driven by the coevolution of predator avoidance in prey. Uh, and I like the saying, if you can't find it, you can't kill it, and you can't eat it, because these all result in the same fitness response of not being able to eat. Uh, so in order to uh, identify these signals of uh, evolution, these evolutionary signals, uh, uh, I first had to establish a genetic basis uh, for predatory trait evolution and functional optimization in pit vipers. Uh, some of the methods that I decided to use to try to approach this is looking at protein evolution and directional selection, uh, looking at the gen genetic interplay of prey perception and prey acquisition, um, and then also using uh, what we're seeing in venom evolution and the optimization of toxins uh, to help me identify areas or directions that I should look for uh, the predatory optimization of perception. And so step one is to look at sequence evolution and expression patterns in sensory genes. So again, I'm looking at uh, the eastern diamondback rattlesnake, Perlis adamantius. Uh, this is the largest uh, rattlesnake species and get over two and a half meters. Uh, they are native to the southeastern United States. Their diet consists of rats, squirrels, rabbits, pretty much any endotherm that will run in front of them. Uh, the organism environment interface consists of four generalized senses, uh, sight, uh, infrared or thermal sensing, touch, and olfaction. Uh, our representative genome is the first ever whole genome assembly for Crotalus adamantius, and we achieved a high coverage by combining short read and long read data generated uh, from Illumina, Pact Bio, and Oxford Nanopore sequencing platforms. I just want to point out, if you see something in red, this is probably either a bioinformatic or sequencing term. Feel free to come talk with me afterwards and I can elabor elaborate more of these, um, but that's what the red means. And again, I have here uh, the central dogma. Uh, this is really uh, imperative in how we annotate these genomes. Um, and basically the better part of the last year, I spent manually annotating gene, or sensory protein coding genes uh, in the genome viewer software of Genius. Um, Molecules gene loci were identified using BLAST, exotic structure mapping uh, via spliceware HiSat2 RNA-seq alignments. Um, and uh, putative protein structure, uh, I predicted using the, the Swiss model access via the XPASI uh, web server. And this is just uh, to give you a little bit of a visual of what a gene annotation consists of. Uh, so in red, these are where my blast hits met. Uh, I started with that to find regions of the genome where I expected to find sensory genes. Below here, these are all the RNA-seq reads lined up. Um, and of course, RNA-seq consists of the messenger RNA, so the introns are already missing, so it's basically just the exons that you see. Um, and then those actually generate, it's hard to see, but the splice sites are in there too. And then using this information, I uh, annotate the exons, coding sequence, and the full gene here. And so this is uh, on the uh, reverse strand, so it's facing in this direction. So that's kind of what it looks like to do a manual gene annotation. Again, the blue up here is just a quick representation, or represent of how many uh, relative transcripts we see down here. Okay, getting back to uh, rattlesnake senses. Uh, first one I looked at is eyesight. Uh, 
Rousing severity and acute eyesight. The rods of cone density in the eyes is very similar to that of your average house cat. Uh, they have very wide optical field of vision. Uh, large vertical pupils, which is consistent with uh, low light detection. And then they have trichromatic color vision. Uh, and this is represented by the genes that I was able to find in the genome. Uh, they have two opsins, a long wavelength and short wavelength sensing. Uh, and then they have a rhodopsin. Uh, you can actually use the, the coding sequences to predict the optimal wavelength corresponding with each of these genes that they detect. Uh, and that basically uh, uses a fancy algorithm to see this distance here and figure out what wavelength of light fits into that space uh, the best. Um, so that's a quick summary of the photosensory genes. Uh, next, I looked at thermal sensation, which is, uh, you know, we call these animals pit vipers, and that's thanks to this uh, specialized pit organ here, uh, which exhibits an infrared vision. Uh, it's bifocal, so they have one on each side of the face. Um, and it enhances their detection of endothermic prey. Uh, the thermal sensing genes, there's two recognized uh, uh, that have uh, thermal sensing functions expressed in the pit organ. And these are both TRP channels. It's TRP A1 and TRP B1. Uh, both of these form uh, homo tetramers, so four of them stick together uh, to form this thing here. Uh, this purple line I put is relatively where the membrane would be, and so over here would be roughly where uh, the temperature sensing would, would occur. Um, and down here is an example of what one of these genes looks like. Uh, this is TRPV1, the 17 exons, so it's a relatively large gene. Uh, moving on to mechanosensation, uh, all snakes can detect uh, low frequency vibrations through the ground, and um, we know that certain prey actually use vibration as a predator deterrent. Uh, notably, uh, the kangaroo rats out west will actually stomp on the ground in front of the snakes to try to throw off their uh, perception of where they are. Um, for mechanosensing genes, I found a handful. Most of these are ion channels, um, but I think what's most interesting is they're absolutely massive. Uh, this is one that's called a, a piezotype mechanosensing of ion channel, and uh, it has 53 exons, and it forms this giant uh, uh, homotrimer. Uh, there's not really a whole lot known about how these things function, just that they're involved in mechanosensing. Uh, for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna be focusing on chemosensation, which uh, I've found some pretty interesting results for. Uh, all snakes use a unique bi-directional olfactory, or olfaction using forked tongue. Uh, scent cues are detected inside the overall nasal organs. They manually deliver scent cues inside of this, top, uh, this organ inside of their, inside of their head. Um, tongue flip behavior corresponds with prey and mate detection. Um, and I found an extreme uh, diversity of uh, chemosensory genes compared to the others, uh, over 800 of these. And so here's a quick summary of uh, the different genes I found. And really the ones that I'm gonna talk about for the rest are the top two, where I'm in the four, over 400 uh, for the, the second type. So olfactory type receptors and vulnerable nasal type receptors. Um, as far as the organization of these in the genome, I'm finding these really big uh, tandem arrays where you'll see not one gene by itself, but usually it's at least five or six, uh, upwards of 40 genes all in a row with uh, uh, pseudogenes scattered among those as well. Um, and again, the olfactory type receptors are monomers, uh, and then the vulnerable nasal type receptors are uh, homodimers, so two of them stick together to form a uh, mature protein. And again, here's another example of this type of protein, same sort of uh, long tandem arrays where there's a lot of them close together. Um, and these, the, the vulnerable nasal type receptors have six exons, um, as you might be able to see down here. Uh, here's, uh, uh, because I was using transcriptomes to map these genes, uh, I was able to look at uh, some uh, expression analysis I uh, did transcripts per million to calculate uh, as a proxy for protein expression using arsen uh, on the trimmed RNA-seq leads. Uh, and I 
I think the most exciting result, I've only done five snakes so far, but I did one juvenile, and uh, the expression was very evenly split between olfactory type receptors and lower nasal type receptors. Uh, whereas the rest that were all uh, uh, older snakes uh, almost look identical where they're just expressing olfactory type receptors in the vulnerable nasal. <laughs> and so because there's so many genes, I was wondering, can I detect signals of gene expansion uh, within a receptor family just for this species? So not looking across other species, but just in this species with all the pair logs, uh, can I look for gene, or, uh, uh, gene expansion? And so to do this, I built gene trees for uh, olfactory type receptors and the vulnerable nasal type receptors uh, using partition binder and RaxML. And then I used the uh, eye tree of light to visualize these trees. And so at first glance, I know this looks like the Death Star. I'll try to help you navigate it a little bit. Uh, so the trees in the middle, uh, but these rings on the outside uh, are actually expression tracks. I don't know how well you guys can see it, but uh, black corresponds with no expression, so zero expression. And uh, lime green is the highest expression. So these are scaled per, fam uh, per gene family. So green is the highest expression of the olfactory type receptors for that individual snake. And so I'll zoom in and you can see a little bit better. Uh, the outside track is the juvenile, and then the older snakes are these four right here. Um, so for the olfactory type receptors, uh, they all agree pretty well. The highest expressed are the same for all of these, and there's just kind of a broad expression um, around this whole uh, gene tree. Uh, but moving to the vulnerable nasal receptor tree, which is just as big, um, there's this really interesting pattern where you just see this blue ring on the outside track, and that's the juvenile snakes. The juvenile is the only one that's expressing the majority of these uh, receptors. Um, also, uh, the four adult snakes seem to be expressing the same three um, and nothing else. Uh, just to zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. I can actually see the tree now a little bit. But uh, um, yeah, so all four are expressing this one and this one. Um, and I think what's interesting is that you see this branch here, uh, there's actually some uh, divergence going on with that particular gene. Uh, every single one of these is a different gene, so uh, I still have, I, this is all very recent, so I still have to go in there and see what exactly is changing uh, about these uh, receptors. Uh, again, same thing down here. You have this long branch, and that's also the highest expressed on this part of the tree. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, I need to do replicates to see if that ontogenetic signal is in fact statistically significant, if it's real. Uh, and then I also uh, want to basically look at uh, character displacement and look at all the different senses and see uh, which genes are actually evolving and or more or less important uh, between sex, between age, and then also uh, forward looking into uh, comparing species and perhaps you know, different regions require different sensing optimization um, and trying to look for signals of evolution there. And we see a lot of this with the venom genes uh, where uh, different areas have different, or sorry, different species have very different venoms, uh, presumably driven by uh, optimization of predation. And so uh, we would expect to see similar signals in all these genes that I pointed out. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for sticking with me. I know we went a little over, uh, but thanks, uh, thanks to National Science Foundation, uh, the Rikita Lab, a group of awesome people to work with, and then uh, our collaborators. With that, I'll take any questions.
they last for a really long time. Um, I have uh, flash frozen tissue samples corresponding with all these transcriptomes. I might push to do some QMS to see if the proteins are still around in the adults. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different reasons uh, that could help that could explain why I saw that signal. Yeah, I wonder if it could work for like spray specialization that occurs for about autophagy, right? Yeah. yeah. So juveniles like to snap up whatever they find. Yeah. And, and we see we see a huge uh, ontogenetic shift in venom too, uh, which makes sense. A small snake isn't going to eat a full-grown rabbit like an adult snake will. Um, an adult snake isn't going to eat a small mouse because that doesn't really that's kind of a waste of time and effort. So yeah, that's absolutely like a possibility. Anyone else? 